Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Discovering in Vivo 12 Plus. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the questions panel on the right-hand side, and we will cover at the end with time permitting. Today's presenter is Stuart Robertson, an in vivo certified platinum partner who has worked closely with QSR International for the past decade. Stuart is an experienced educator who first began working with in vivo 2 during his doctoral coursework. And with that, I'll hand it over to Stuart. All right, thank you, Caitlin. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, as Caitlin said, uh, my name is Stuart Robertson, and I actually come at in vivo uh, from a very practical and pragmatic standpoint. It is uh, definitely a tool that I feel helped me be able to do a better job of my initial research as I came into qualitative research uh, and has uh, enriched not only the work that I've done, but the work that others have uh, turned to me for assistance with. Because of this, Invivo is the global number one software for qualitative data analysis across all the different markets from government, commercial to academia. Probably the key features, uh, the, the key reasons people will turn to uh, software such as Invivo is that it saves, saves time. Um, you're working far more efficiently. You've got pretty much everything in one place uh, that you can begin to quickly, as your aha moments happen, you can turn and move to a different pieces of your project, you can quickly organize and retrieve data, uncover connections uh, that just aren't possible manually, uh, and most importantly is rig rigorously be able to back up your findings with evidence. And that's the key as we're trying to share our findings out with colleagues and stakeholders. I know many of you are familiar with InVivo uh, from the ability to be able to gather many different types of information, import them into one project, uh, be able to work with them and visualize and share, and ultimately be able to have some type of finished product that you can uh, then uh, add to your curriculum vita to be able to share with your colleagues and others. The wide variety of types of data with which InVivo can work is uh, very powerful. From being able to pull in some of the bibliographic information that you've been collecting right from the very beginning, to being able to take in the text and the video and the audio pieces that you're looking at, uh, survey data as more and more people are working with mixed methods, uh, bring, being able to bring in from Qualtrics, from SurveyMonkey, and now with InVivo 12, being able to exchange with SPSS uh, so that it just keeps becoming a more integrated part of the research process. For someone like myself, who's very visual, uh, the powerful analysis I can take from visualizations uh, really help me sort of step up my research there. And I'm often able to pick up on some subtleties that I might have missed in, say, just text alone. Uh, it also gives me a chance to be able to uh, test some hunches uh, to be able to think, well, what if I look at these two pieces? What if I look at these and see how they might be connected? Uh, and it gets my brain working in other directions. Again, being able to view through different lenses from looking at charts and graphs to the matrix coding query to the new crosstab. Uh, so there are time periods where I might want to look for potential patterns in some quantitative counts, but the fact that I can double click on a cell and be right back into my uh, data 
to me was incredibly important that I never wanted to be separated from my data, which gives me the story behind the number. Today we're looking at Invivo Plus, which is our most powerful research software. Uh, some of the key features that you can access in there are the automated insights. Uh, the fact that we can uh, use an algorithm to detect uh, and code themes or sentiment uh, in your sources to speed up the analysis, which in some cases we do want to try to get into our data uh, quickly so that we can spend our time thinking about what it means uh, in, in the process and looking at what's there. Uh, but also, I feel very strongly about the fact that it can help, uh, it can help me address the concerns around possible bias. Uh, we'll look at the auto coding and oftentimes people think about it in terms of the beginning of the process. Uh, but I have equally used the auto coding feature toward the end of the coding process uh, for two reasons. One, I want to see if the algorithm turns up any topics that I might have missed, uh, just missed along the way, or if perhaps I have a, a bias uh, that may have blocked me from seeing something that was right there. Um, looking at additional visualizations, uh, looking at connections and networks, and this is one thing that I did find very powerful. I love the maps that are available in both the Pro and the Plus version. Uh, but there are time periods that I'm specifically looking at how uh, pieces of my project, or, or actually oftentimes it's um, units of my analysis might be connected uh, from individual people to organizations. Um, what organizations answer to whom, which organizations turn to whom for funding uh, to get some of the ideas about how, if I want to get that information out, I can do just that. And that folds right in, of course, to the social network analysis so that you can start to look at some of these components, looking at degree in, degree out between this closeness um, and trying to get a sense of how this uh, network works together and interacts, which in turn may also help you understand how you can uh, get information into that network. Um, oftentimes, there's, uh, we may be studying to find better ways to reach out to uh, a given population or a given group uh, to be able to get pertinent and important information into their hands. Uh, there's also pattern-based auto-coding, and, and this is a feature oftentimes that gets overlooked in, in vivo. The fact that you can do some coding of the, your data and then in turn ask in vivo to look at the coding you've done and try to uh, detect patterns or trends and then use those to add additional data to the nodes that you've created. So there's some very powerful pieces here. Um, but I think the important thing to remember is these are here as tools for the researcher, not in place of the researcher. These tools have limitations, but the researcher can use them in very powerful ways. So let's take a look at in vivo in action. And today's focus will be on uh, some of these, uh, these key tools. So I'm just going to take a moment here and swap my uh, screen out. And I will be, so my screen decides to change here. Actually, it's more my mouse today. <laughs> there we go. Um, so I am using uh, InVivo Plus, 
uh, which is uh, the Windows-based uh, version, uh, one of two versions that uh, are Windows-based for in vivo. Today, I'm using the sample project uh, just to uh, demonstrate some of the pieces of these auto coding um, automated tools that can help. If I go to my uh, data for a moment uh, and I'll open up my interviews, I can use the auto coding features as I'm bringing in new data or with data that I might already have in place. So for example, if I wanted to take some of my interviews here, uh, maybe I don't necessarily uh, want to focus on all of them, uh, but perhaps a subsection of those interviews, I can select those interviews and using the uh, ribbon, the home-based ribbon here, I've got my auto code feature and I can identify themes in those particular uh, in those particular interviews. And right now in Vivo is going through, it's using the algorithm. It's looking both within and across those uh, those interviews. And I think that's a piece that I, I really want to make sure that I mention that in this case it's looking within each of the interviews, but it's also looking across them. This comes in, in play, especially if you are working with surveys. I just want to mention one thing with surveys. Uh, if you're bringing in surveys where you have multiple open-ended questions, the strategy that may best meet your needs would actually be to allow InVivo to bring in and separate the open-ended questions and then run the autocoding algorithm on each of the questions. Oftentimes there's disparity between the questions that we ask and because it looks across all of the questions, that can uh, have an impact on the results. So for maximum benefit, when you're thinking about it in terms of a survey, uh, it's easier or better to bring in the questions and then run it on the questions. In the case of interviews, because there's often uh, a mixing of answers of topics across the discussion, no matter how well we think we have uh, structured it, uh, that does not come into play quite as much. Right now, I can get a quick look at uh, the topics that were generated. Uh, and I may find very quickly that there are some that I don't necessarily need uh, for this particular study. And I can choose to uh, not create those. Uh, I also have potential sub uh, nodes or child nodes. And I may go ahead and keep those intact and later on on, I could merge some of those together uh, as I find that they might be um, overlapping in some of the ways that we're looking at them. I'll go ahead and uh, click next here. I like the fact that I can choose whether I want to code sentences or paragraphs, uh, that I have some control over that piece. Uh, because there are time periods where perhaps in the beginning I want to uh, focus on a small piece to be able to do some quick review and some decision making as to what seems appropriate and what might I want to uncode. I'll go ahead and click next. Uh, in this case, I can place them in a folder called uh, Autocoded Themes. I can create a, another folder if I wish. Uh, so this could be uh, auto-coded themes from selected interviews. I'll go ahead and 
click finish. And now uh, InVivo provides me with a couple of quick views into my data. I get a hierarchy diagram that will allow me to see the topics uh, that have been generated, to see the subtopics, uh, child nodes the, under each of them, and for me to get a sense of what were uh, some of my more um, popular topics, so to speak. Uh, what were my, my pieces there? And even just being able to bring my cursor over it and see the coding references, see them broken down by direct and aggregated, um, having that ability in a hierarchy diagram uh, is quite, quite helpful. I also have a matrix so that I can get a sense of uh, what themes seem to be represented, represented in the different uh, interviews themselves. And again, the fact that I can double click on a cell and be able to see the data behind the number is really quite important in order to be able to uh, stay connected with my data. Let me clean up my screen here a little bit and we'll move over to the, the node so we can see uh, exactly what took place here. Uh, so I have my uh, under my nodes, my auto-coded themes and auto-coded themes from selected interviews uh, so that I can take a look at uh, the data, um, how many files are represented, how many references I have, uh, being able to uh, double click and open up a node uh, so that I can review the data that's there. And again, I always have the ability uh, to be able to uncode. Uh, so if I find a piece of data that I know is very obviously um, not uh, appropriate for that particular node, uh, I can uncode from this node in order to be able to take it out. I, uh, of course, I'm always connected back to the original source uh, so that I can start to see uh, what has been coded. And in this case, it has, because I asked it to, it has coded sentences. If I decide that there might be some pieces that don't necessarily need to be coded, or if there's some things that I would like to additionally code, uh, I do have that ability. Uh, to be able to add to that coding. Uh, so I, again, as the researcher, I have that ability to be able to adjust the coding to match the needs of my particular study. I also have the ability to be able to merge different topics together. Uh, and it could be at any level. So for example, I have fish houses and I have fishing and I may review those two and decide at some point that really I can take and merge them together. I can collapse fish houses into fishing. And very quickly and very easily, I can uh, be able to cut one node and be able to merge it into the other. I might also want to get a sense of uh, positive and negative uh, feelings or sentiment uh, across some of these topics uh, so that I can uh, look at my sources or I can look at my nodes themselves and I can autocode to identify theme, uh, identify sentiment. Uh, again, I'll stick with sentences here. And the sentiment analysis works based on words. Uh, so that if you were bringing in, uh, for example, the survey that I mentioned earlier, if I'm bringing in a survey, I can run the sentiment analysis right at the very beginning because it is word specific. 
basically the algorithm looks at words, provides a value between negative one and positive one, and then adjusts that value based on the words around it. So where it is focused on the word, not the context uh, as much across different uh, questions, it is less likely to be swayed uh, from question to question. Uh, so that's one you could do at the very beginning, or as I've done here, I've taken a look at it uh, to get a sense of what types of comments are being made across my various uh, topics uh, that I wanted to take a look at. And I wanted to do it that way because oftentimes we think about using it in terms of the uh, files, the documents, the data. Uh, but it also has power if I want to take a look at some of these uh, nodes that may have been created here. Uh, and being able to take a look at those pieces so that I've got uh, a breakdown and I can take a look at what might be potentially very positive comments or very negative comments uh, about some of these uh, topics. Again, because the researcher is still an intricate part of the process, even with the sentiment, if I go to my sentiment uh, no, nodes, I can open up uh, a sentiment node and I can then review. And if I find something that I feel may not necessarily be uh, very positive, I can uh, quickly change that to what I feel might be more appropriate. Uh, even going down to uh, uncoding it if it's really more of a neutral statement or moving it to a different um, sentiment level uh, as I'm looking at some of these pieces. Those are two of uh, the key things uh, that are helpful uh, when you're looking at PLUS. The other one that was mentioned earlier was the fact that if I have created some nodes, I can also use the work that I've done to sort of seed some more coding. Uh, and in, in that vein, if I come back to my um, home uh, menu here, and perhaps I want to, I'll choose some of my interviews. Uh, and let's say that I have coded uh, some of my interviews. I have some that I have not looked at yet, uh, perhaps the ones that I've just selected. I can use another one of my auto coding uh, features, being able to use existing coding patterns. Uh, and I can go ahead and click Next here. And Invivo allows me to decide if I want to use all of my nodes, if I want to keep them all included, or oftentimes there may be selected nodes that I want to take a look at, um, specific nodes that I feel may lend themselves more to uh, some of these topics. So, for example, uh, I might be looking at uh, real estate development, agriculture, fishing or aquaculture, jobs and cost of living, tourism. Uh, I'll just start with that sampling for right now. I can decide how uh, broad or narrow I want in vivo to apply uh, the patterns that it finds. Basically, I'm making a decision. Do I want it to code more or less? Sometimes I may want it to code more so that I can go in and uh, begin to weed out the pieces that I don't necessarily want there. On the other hand, there may be time periods where I'd like to get it as tight as I could so that I would perhaps minimize uh, the amount of weeding out that I'd have to do. Uh, and it may be a matter of I want to see if there is some evidence uh, to support it. But I may not at that point in time necessarily need a fully a full count of what might be in the data. 
it depends on the questions that I'm answering. Um, so I have that ability. Uh, for this run, I'll leave it right in the middle uh, just to get a sense of what might be happening. And it will be checking, first it will check the nodes that I've created and it will review for me whether or not um, there were issues detected. So I have a number of nodes in which, in which <clears throat> no issues were detected. Um, so it's probably, there's enough there in Vivo Fields that we can move forward without any problem. I do have some though in which there was inconsistent vocabulary. And in a case like this, I may then want to go back and review these nodes to think about why, <clears throat> pardon me, what might be in the vocabulary there uh, that's giving that inconsistency. Uh, pardon me just a moment, I'll be right back with you. I do apologize for that. Um, so again, I want to go back. It doesn't mean that I cannot use them. If I choose, I certainly can uh, continue forward and be able to use uh, those particular nodes. And Invivo will then go through and I can start to see each of the sources that I selected. And I can see how many references were taken from each uh, and applied to specific nodes. Okay. So this is one where you're doing some groundwork or I, I sort of say seeding it uh, insofar as you're going to do some initial coding. Uh, so that Invivo can then use those patterns uh, to continue the auto-coding uh, part of the work there. The other piece in Invivo Plus that I wanted to touch upon was the idea of uh, being able to dabble into social networks and social network analysis. Uh, and that can come in a couple of different ways. Uh, oftentimes, one of the uh, first ways will happen in the relationships uh, that are created. Uh, when putting together a project, you may be creating relationships uh, if it's among people, uh, who works with whom, who talks with whom, uh, who answers to whom. Uh, if you're bringing in, for example, an um, out, um, yes, Outlook, um, bringing in your email uh, and you have a whole bunch of emails, it will generate a, a network sociogram so you can see who's emailing whom, who's responding to whom, uh, and get a sense of what may be happening there. Uh, one of the groups that I worked with uh, was actually looking at uh, the relationship among providers of infrastructure uh, in a local region. And they were, um, they created the relationships uh, which companies turn to which companies in order to um, subcontract or get supplies and be able to see if you needed to interact with this system or if you needed to infuse something into it, where were some of your key points to be able to do that? In the sample project, what I did is I created some additional uh, relationships, uh, things such as works with, talks with, uh, they have a few that are uh, showing is married to. And the reason that I did that was under the explore uh, tab, one of my options is to take and look at a uh, network sociogram. And I can decide which cases uh, or which pieces of search folders I might want to include. 
Uh, in this example, under the interview participants, I focused on those. I certainly can choose them all if I wish, or there may be time periods where uh, I may have focused on some particular uh, people within this group uh, as I'm looking at uh, the pieces that are here. So let me just grab a couple of, couple of more people and I'll go ahead and click OK. And Invivo will create the network sociogram for me. I kept this one small so that we could um, be able to focus on some of the parts and pieces of it. Uh, I can see that uh, poor Margaret's left out of this. Uh, so I may want to look at that and say, okay, did I miss some relationships with Margaret uh, that might be there? Or uh, is there, might there be a reason why she might be offset from the rest of this group? Uh, and again, I can start to see uh, where I might have connections. So for example, uh, Barbara may not be directly connected to Daniel, but via Maria. Uh, there certainly can be an exchange of information or thoughts and ideas going on here. Um, I can focus on particular relationships if I wish. Uh, so I could turn off is married to and focuses, focus just on talks with, uh, or be able to, to redraw some of those pieces as needed. I can also adjust the display uh, so that I can look at uh, the size of the vertices. Uh, and then maybe uh, with this one, I might look at um, between this. You know, where am I higher uh, between this? So Barbara right now became my largest uh, vertices and Maria is there. So I can start to see who are my interconnected people as I'm looking at some of these. Uh, or I might want to uh, look at colors based on degree out. Uh, who am I going to turn to if I want to get information out into this network? Or even um, scaling the edges uh, by number of relationships. So I've got an ability to start to be able to visualize what's happening here. I also have the ability to uh, see the centrality measures uh, that are going along with it. So if I am trying to incorporate uh, some social network analysis into my project, I've got tools now that I can begin uh, that process within in vivo. I can also export. I can export my list if I wish. Uh, I can send it out to Excel, for example, uh, rich text format, PDFs if I wish, uh, figuring out how it might best serve uh, the pieces that I have here. Uh, the same thing is true if I'm looking at my diagram. I always have the ability to export the diagram. I can export it as an image or as an edge list, uh, depending on what other software. I might be using um, within the project. This is from the Explorer is the, the network sociogram. So I'm taking a, a look across the, the network that I have here, but I can also create and look at connections uh, for a particular piece of my project. Uh, for example, with the cases, uh, I can I'll go into my uh, people cases here. And for my interview participants, I'll, I'll choose Barbara. And I can create an egocentric sociogram so that Barbara will be the center of my sociogram here. And I can start to see where there are connections. Uh, so I'm bringing in where she grew up, uh, talks with, grew up in, uh, went to school at and start to see some of those pieces. I've got uh, right now, as I'm looking at this uh, in my sociogram, um, two levels going on here. Uh, Bobbert talks with Maria, and I can start to see uh, how many steps. So I've got two steps. 
I can then come over to my display and there is a third level here if I wish. Uh, so I can add a third level to this connection. And suddenly I start to see a very complex um, connection between and among uh, items from my project. Uh, again, using Barbara as the center point uh, in this collection. I also wanted to point out that with the social network analysis, uh, if I have brought in social media, and in particular, if I've brought in something from Twitter. Uh, so there's an example of uh, the Twitter, Cataract County on Twitter. Um, when I open up that uh, piece that I brought in, I have a lot of my traditional pieces here. Uh, so I, I definitely have my uh, data set where I'm looking at um, my usernames, my tweet types, and retweets, and all of that great information. Um, I've got the ability, if, if there were locations given, to look at the map. But in plus, I also have a Twitter sociogram. And I can begin to visualize uh, what might be happening uh, within my uh, within those connections. And this one focuses on uh, retweets and mentions. So I can see uh, who's mentioning whom, uh, who may be retweeting whom as I'm looking at this. Uh, so it gives me another component, uh, another way of being able to look at the data that I'm bringing in uh, to this particular structure. All right, let me step out for uh, just a moment here. Uh, I want to go back and touch upon a few other points in the PowerPoint, and then I will open up the question panel uh, and see what has uh, come in via the, the questions. Again, today we looked at in Vivo Plus, and in particular, a lot of the uh, automated features. Uh, but in Vivo Plus is, of course, a component of an InVivo suite, including InVivo Pro, which is Windows-based, InVivo for Mac, and InVivo for Teams, um, which connects in Vivo 12 Plus and Pro uh, to manage projects centrally in real-time collaboration. Uh, centralized data storage and backup uh, abilities become involved. Uh, but again, the basis of everything that you do is the InVivo program itself. There are uh, in vivo certification courses. Uh, there is a certified expert uh, course. This is designed to uh, work with someone who has been uh, working with in vivo and uh, give them some additional skills so they could consult uh, at your university uh, to be able to uh, be a go-to person. And uh, in the CHEST agreement, there are, uh, for depending on when you have recently um, re-upped, so to speak, in the, in the CHEST agreement, uh, there may be abilities there for up to two people uh, to become certified experts. Uh, again, you would want to check with your representative. Uh, there's also a certified trainer option for people who want to go beyond. Uh, you start out uh, through the certified expert and upon completion and the ability to uh, do some training, you can then later, uh, if you wish, uh, apply for the certified trainer. Um, so, which will be listed on the QSR International website as a certified trainer. And this would be for someone who might want to run their own training business. Getting started with InVivo, um, we've worked very diligently to make it as easy as possible. Uh, we have revamped the customer support and resources from the Welcome to InVivo video, which comes up when you open uh, a project and you have access to there, to the Getting Started tutorials, 
which can be found on the InVivo website in the customer success section, um, which is, again, being designed and um, to be a, a resource-rich place uh, that InVivo users can go and take advantage of all that's available. Um, free educational webinars, something such as this one, or uh, we may be doing others where uh, we'll have guest speakers come in and talk about how they've used in vivo in a very practical way and how they thought about it um, in, in making it part of their research. Uh, there is an FAQ section, and of course, in vivo help is there. Uh, there's online communities. Uh, that are available to you. Uh, and if you have people outside your organization that maybe haven't tried it yet, uh, letting them know that there is a 14-day free trial if they want to give it, uh, get a sense of, of how it works. If you're looking at this and thinking that you'd like to be able to take advantage of some of the capabilities in InVivo Plus, um, current InVivo Pro Chest Agreement customers uh, can now upgrade to InVivo Plus for a significantly reduced fee. Um, so please, please, please reach out to uh, the, InVivo's, uh, the InVivo office, uh, the EMEA office, um, to find out about a quote. Um, it may be a, a great opportunity for you to uh, be able to offer um, some additional powerful tools to faculty and students um, to help them go further with their research. All right. At this point, I'm going to open up the question panel and uh, just see uh, if any have come in. Um, Okay, question came in um, about was any of the demo 12 Pro or all 12 Plus? Uh, the over, uh, overwhelming majority of it was 12 Plus. The algorithms, uh, the sentiment, the uh, thematic, and the social network are all available only in 12 Plus. Uh, the, you know, I'm trying to think if the, um, the last one that I showed, uh, the coding, is may now only be available in 12 plus. If there was anything that was in pro, it would have been the last one. Uh, I do apologize uh, for a moment. I'm, I'm having a, uh, a brain hiccup, as they say. Um, at one point, it may have been, but it may have moved to plus. However, the remainder of the materials are definitely all in plus. Sometimes, too, people do, there, there is a concern, and I do completely understand it, um, that when you're looking at qualitative uh, analysis, uh, the use of algorithms can be uncomfortable uh, for some researchers, and I certainly respect that. Um, and, and that's why I wanted to share, too, that even when I don't necessarily use it to get me started in the process, um, I will often turn to it toward the end of the process to be able to uh, get a sense of, did I miss anything? Uh, I'm always amazed at how easily our bias can blind us. Um, and, and I've used, uh, I, I also teach um, in a local uh, college, uh, pre-practicum or pre-practice uh, teachers. And of course, we talk about being able to observe and see, and they believe that they'll see everything. Um, they don't realize how easily our bias can step into the way. Um, and that's why I do like to be able to have tools such as these, uh, to be able to give myself another way of um, checking for uh, the interference of personal bias in there. Um, initially, early on, it was when the text search query uh, added in synonyms. 
by using uh, generated synonyms uh, generated by someone other than myself, uh, I felt that I was taking a step toward uh, perhaps combating uh, some of my personal biases uh, to, to have something placed right in front of me. Now with the thematic analysis, it's even more powerful um, to be able to do that and be able to see those pieces. Uh, as we're looking at it. So I do like to mention that. Um, the other thing too, I do like the social network analysis because there are time periods where I do want to see the connections. And the other three maps are very good. I, I use the, the mind map, the project map, the concept map, I certainly do. But I feel like the social network uh, mapping uh, ability in PLUS uh, when I am specifically uh, focused upon that um, is just much uh, more direct vision of what's happening. Um, I feel that it gives me a clearer picture uh, and I really appreciate that. Uh, ability to be able to do that as well. Right, right now I don't uh, see any more questions um, and I do realize we are heading towards the top of the hour uh, and I do want to be respectful of your time and thank you so much uh, for taking your time, uh, time out of your busy schedule to be with me today. I do hope this gave you some information that you can think about and think about in terms of um, your students, your faculty, the users of Invivo in your organizations, uh, and see if this may be um, a time to that you're able to um, give them some additional tools uh, to strengthen the great work that they're already doing. Once again, and I just wanted to check in. Uh, Caitlin, is there any additional information uh, that we need to share with them? Uh, no, there's nothing additional at this time. Thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you, Stuart, for your presentation. You're very welcome. Take care everyone and bye for now. <laughs>